Well, good evening. How are you tonight? Well, a few of you are okay. The rest of you are kind of asleep, and that's all right. Been a long day, hadn't it? Seems to me every time it rains, I just get tired. It just makes me want to sleep. So with this rain all day, I'm glad that you made it to church this evening. We're going to be in John chapter number 5 tonight. John chapter number 5. And there are fill-in-the-blank notes on the app again, if you'd like to follow along there, just like you can on Sundays. But John chapter number 5. Last week we looked at how we are the salt of the earth and how we are the light of the world. But tonight I want us to look at the life of a man who really could probably be pretty easily overlooked in Scripture. This is a guy we don't read a whole lot about. And he's a man who had some pretty serious problems in life. John chapter number 5, we'll start reading in verse number 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Now that's kind of an important thing because there was three times each year that the Jews would come together for one of these feasts and they looked forward to it and it was a kind of a big deal. Everybody wanted to go to Jerusalem for these feasts and the celebration that came along with it. It was a good time, supposedly, according to some of the things that I've read. But it's kind of sad that out of all these people who came to celebrate at this religious festival, at this feast, that no one was going to see this man, no one was going to go out of their way to talk to this man, no one was going to go out of their way to help the man that we're going to look at tonight. You'd think that some devout person, some uh, religious person would take notice of the man we're going to read about and would have intervened in his life, but nobody did. As God's people, though, we should always be on the lookout for people who need help, shouldn't we? We ought to always be looking out for people like that. The end of verse 1 says, it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So it was Jesus' custom to go to the temple. He was coming into the area. Luke 4 tells us that so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as, as his custom was... He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So we know that it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He was one who went to church. If he was here today, this is where he would be. He would be in church on the Sabbath day, and I'm sure he'd be here on a Wednesday night because he's Jesus, right? So he's not going to be tired and after work. He's he's probably going to be at church. It's kind of his house, so I'm sure he'd show up. You know, if Jesus, the Son of God felt the need to go to church, felt this need to go to the synagogue, how much more should we today feel the need to be a part of a church? So that was Jesus' custom. Look at verse 2. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool. That's kind of interesting because this sheep gate was, was where they would bring the lambs that were going to be sacrificed. That's where they brought them. So this was a pretty busy area. All the people would come by here. This was one of the busiest places in all the city. And even though this guy was around a lot of religious people, a lot of them going by him, they were in this area, he was still alone, as we're going to see as we go through this story. And it's kind of sad that we as Christians, how many times do we get so wrapped up in what we've got to do that we forget about people? Whether it's, oh man, I got to get to church, I got to be here, I got to help this, I got to do that, I signed up to do this, all of these things, but we drive right by people who need Jesus. We see them everywhere and we see them all over the place. We can get wrapped up in religious exercises and, and miss people who need our help and our compassion. They go unnoticed because of our busyness. The end of verse 2 says, which is called in Hebrew, talking about this area, Bethesda, having five porches. That word Bethesda is interesting because it means house of mercy. Here's a guy we're going to read about who's been crippled for 38 years. He was lame. 38 years and got no mercy. In other words, the place that was known as the house of mercy showed no mercy. This guy who needed it probably more than anybody else got none of what he needed in the area that he should have gotten help. And may God help us as Christians and help our church to be a place of mercy. How many of you at one point in your life, you needed some mercy in your life? You needed some grace? Because we all have got some messed up past, don't we? We're broken people. We're sinners. But this man, he didn't get it. Verse 3. In these lay a great multitude of sick people here at this pool in Bethesda, blind, 
lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. It's not just this one man who's here who's ill. There's people all over the place. It says a multitude of sick people. There was blind, there was lame, there was paralyzed. There was a lot of hurting people right outside, right in the area where all these religious people were going. They're right in the way. These religious folks, these Christians, these people who were going to the temple walked by them all the time. But we never read about any of them stopping to talk to this man or to any of them or try to help them in any way. They were hurting. They're close to the temple. And they're just waiting for something miraculous to happen, a moving of the water. Because as the, the Bible teach, tells us as we go down, look at verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the waters. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the waters was made well of whatever disease he had. So if you were sick, if you were struggling with some kind of a disease and, and you're sitting here by this pool in Bethesda and you're waiting, you're watching for the water to begin to stir. And when, as soon as that water started to move around, the first person who got into the water was healed of whatever it was that they were struggling with. How many of you, if you were struggling with some serious disease, you'd have been sitting right on the edge? I'd have been sitting there with my feet in the water waiting. I'd have made sure I was right there. But this man was paralyzed. He was lame. He had no use of his legs. So he couldn't get over there. He was, he was laying there waiting, and we don't know how long he had been here, obviously for some time. But here's this guy. He couldn't do anything to help himself. None of these people around this pool could heal themselves. That's why they were here. They had no way of saving themselves from the, the pain or the torment or the, the, the ailment that they were struggling with. So they're here. They have to wait for the water to stir, but they couldn't help themselves. And there are so many people today in our world that we pass and we see every day who can't help themselves. They're struggling with an illness that's terminal. What is it? Sin. Absolutely. And they have no way of saving themselves because the Bible says that we can. It's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but it's by His, what He did. It's His mercy, His grace that saves us. So there's no way that they can save themselves, and they're just waiting for something to happen because none of us are able to save ourselves. It's only what Christ did on Calvary that can save us from our sins, right? Look at verse 5. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Here he is. We're getting introduced to him. This guy's been in this condition for 38 years. Can you imagine 38 years? Ralph, you've been struggling with your leg for a long time, but it ain't been 38 years, has it? Can you imagine 38 years not being able to walk? At this point, after 38 years, this guy's probably lost hope. The doctors have probably said, we've done all we can do. There's nothing that we can do to help you. You're just going to have to live with this for the rest of your life. And probably this man had probably given up hope on himself, except for just that slim chance that he could be the first one to get into the water, even though he was lame and couldn't get over to the water quickly. But then something happens in his life. Somebody takes an interest in him and changes his life forever. 38 years. Hard case. Doctors gave up hope. He had given up hope probably. But somebody made a difference in his life. I'm thankful God doesn't give up on hard cases, aren't you? There's no case that's too hard for him. Let me ask you this. Remember, you can talk to me, remember? So we, we can converse a little bit. How many of you grew up in church? Would you raise your hand? Good group of you. That's awesome. How many of you, before you came to Christ, you would consider yourself to have lived a pretty decent life? Yeah, I got saved when I was a young boy. Like the worst thing I had done was like talk back to my mom. I was worse after I got saved than I was before I got saved. Yeah. How many of you would consider yourself a hard case? Didn't get saved till later in life, lived a pretty rough life? Yeah, a few of you? Yeah. But God doesn't give up on hard cases just because they're hard. He can save hard cases too. Look at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there, <laughs> Jesus saw him. That's so cool because everybody else missed him. And even though the religious people didn't see him, Jesus saw him and knew that he had already 
had been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? Is that like a dumb question? He's sitting next to the pool waiting. But Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? Why? Because he's wanting this man to start to think. Yeah, I want to be made well. Yeah, of course. Why else would I be here? He's trying to get him agreeing with him, trying to get him on the same page. The sick man, verse 7, answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. That's probably one of the saddest phrases in all of Scripture. Sir, I have no man to help me. How sad is that? Religious people all around. Christians passing him right and left. They're busy. They're going to get their lamb that they have put into the sheep gate so that they can go and make a sacrifice. They're following their religious duties. But while they're following their religious duties, they missed a man who was hurting, who was broken. He had no one to help him. Kind of reminds me of Acts chapter 8. This, there's an interesting story where this Ethiopian eunuch was reading in Isaiah 53, and Philip the, runs up next to him and asks him, Do you understand what you're reading? And what did the Ethiopian eunuch say? Yeah, how can I unless someone's going to guide me? I, I can't understand this. Somebody's got to help me. Sir, I have no man to help me. Almost the same thing is said there, and how sad it is. This lame man wasn't helpless because there wasn't a cure, although there wasn't, but that's not what made him helpless. He wasn't helpless because he was unwilling to try everything he could. I'm sure he'd been to the doctors. We know he's tried everything because he's sitting there next to the water waiting for his chance. He's just waiting to see that water stir. So he's trying his best. That, it wasn't that he was sick just because he wasn't trying to. He was helpless because he had nobody to help him. True, God does the work. But he uses human instruments like us to make it possible. Before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he says in John chapter 11, verse 39, he tells the people this. He says, take away the stone. Lazarus is dead. In the tomb. Out. Three days. And Jesus comes up and tells them to roll away the stone. Now, could Jesus have rolled away the stone himself? Of course he could have. He's about to raise a man from the dead. If you can raise a man from the dead, you can probably move a rock. Roll away the stone. They roll away the stone, and what happens? Jesus calls Lazarus, come forth. My dad used to always joke and say he believed that, that, God said, that Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, because if he had just said, come forth, everybody would have got up in that grave and come out. But he says, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus raised the dead but he wanted us to roll away the stone. And until we do what we're supposed to do, God's not going to do what he can do. He's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to take a step of faith. We don't save the lost, but God set it up so that we have a part in getting them to him. I wonder how many people there are that we pass every day who would want a relationship with Jesus if we would just take some time and care about them. How many of you came to Christ because a friend or a family member introduced you to Jesus, shared the gospel with you? Yeah. What if they hadn't? Where would you be? Yeah? Definitely wouldn't be on the same path, that's for sure. Jail? <laughs> Maybe dead? I, I don't know what path you were on before you came to Christ. But what if they had thought, and I, I don't want to embarrass myself by sharing the gospel with them. I don't want to share my relationship with Christ with them. I, they're too hard. They're, they, they would never listen to me. But they cared. And they shared and they helped. And they took a step. Look at verse 8. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately, verse 9, the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Jesus tells him, take up your bed and walk. And immediately, it didn't happen in a few seconds, as soon as this man had faith enough to stand, to do what Jesus said, he was saved and he was healed. And that's the way faith is. God, we have to trust him in faith. For by grace are ye saved through... Okay, that was pathetic. For by grace are ye saved through... Faith, there we go. I know it's Wednesday night and you're tired. You've had a long day at work and I'm just thankful you're here tonight. So, 
But that's the way salvation is. It's immediate and it's in response to our faith. When he took up, then he takes up his bed and he walks. And what happened is when he got up, it was obvious that something was different. 38 years, the guy's not been able to stand. But as soon as he meets Jesus, everything changes. And it didn't just change for him. Can you imagine all the people that were laying around talking to him every day, waiting on the pool to get stirred? Sitting there talking every day. His friends, people he'd become close to. Do you think it was obvious to them that something happened to him? Dude, you just got up. <laughs> what happened to you? There's a change that came. And when we come to Christ, our life should change too. It reminds me of the, the little kid's song that we used to sing when I was a little kid. It's all the things I used to do. I don't do them anymore. You ever sing that song when you were a kid? Or is that just a southern thing? Okay. Preacher, you know that one? Pastor Emerson, you know that one? Did you hear that one when you were a kid in Kentucky? You didn't get that one? Man, I'm telling you what. It's hilarious. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. You really? How many of you have heard that? Well, you just did, so all of you have heard it now. I mean, come on now. But it's true. The things I used to do, the way my life used to be, the things that I used to say, the places I used to go, the way I used to talk, Everything ought to change because there's been a great change since I've been born again. When Christ came in and filled my heart, my life changed. Cleanse me from sin. My life will never be the same again. Everything changed. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. <laughs> There's the religious people again. They always had a way of just throwing a wet blanket on young Christians, didn't they? Always opening their mouth and inserting foot and trying to mess with things. Our rules say you can't do what you're doing. <laughs> they never noticed him when he was crippled, did they? They never noticed him while he's laying there and he's lame and his legs don't work. But as soon as he did something that went against their traditions, they came after him. There's a lot of Christians like that today, isn't there? God help us never to be like that. Verse 11, and he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. He said, the guy who healed me told me to do it. You know, if somebody was able to heal me, I'm going to do whatever they say, no matter what it is. And that's what this man did. And he got in a little bit of trouble with the Christians. Verse 12, then they asked him, who is the man who told you, take up your bed and walk? Who told you that? Verse 13, but the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. He couldn't tell them who did it. It was just somebody who walked up to him and began to talk to him. Didn't introduce himself very early in Jesus' ministry. It's not the, the fame and all of the things that went around. But here's a man, he, Jesus just it says he had withdrawn because it was a multitude. He kind of slipped back into the crowd and just kind of disappeared. He may not have remembered his name. But I guarantee you he'd never forget the meeting. And that's all the way it ought to be with us as Christians when we come to Christ. I may not remember what date it was. I remember when I got saved. It was June the 4th, 1982. I can take you to the room. I know the wallpaper. I can picture it all in my mind. But I have a friend who was riding in an airplane. He's a preacher. And he was riding in an airplane, and they hit some turbulence. And the, the um, what are those things called? The overhead bins? opened up and a suitcase came out and hit him in the head and he got it messed with his memory and he was he never remembered anything before that accident but if you asked him if he was a christian you know what he'd tell you absolutely i know i met jesus i don't remember when it was but i know i'm saved you know we may not remember when it was but we better remember that it was <laughs> it makes a difference in our life everything changes Verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple <laughs> and said to him, See, you've been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. This guy who's been sitting outside the religious crowd, outside the temple, between where the sheep were, were kept and where the sacrifices were made and all this, this guy who's been there for 38 years trying to get into this pool, now that he's healed, where is he? He's not sitting outside anymore. Where did Jesus find him? He was in the temple. 
Now, when you meet Jesus, everything changes. Where he was positionally changed. He was outside, now he's inside. Bible doesn't tell us what he was doing in there, but I would say if it was me and I'd been crippled for 38 years and I was healed, I'd probably be in there praising God and thanking God for what happened in my life. I think that's what he's doing. I think this guy's so excited. He's in there worshiping God. God, thank you so much. And just praising God, and he's all excited about what's happened to him. And when Jesus changed me, I wanted to do the same thing. I was just a young boy. And I used to do something that was really stupid. I used to tell everybody about Jesus. I'd go into a bathroom as a young boy. And I'd go up and start using the restroom. Some other, somebody else walked in. I'd, start, I'd turn around and start talking to them. Hey, you know, my dad told me, son, you can't talk to people here in the restroom. So you got to be careful. Yeah, so he kind of put me a little straight and narrow. But I was, what? I was excited. I wanted to share what happened to me. I want to tell everybody that I'm a Christian, that heaven is my home, that I don't have to go to hell anymore. I just wanted everybody to know it. And that's what happens when we come to Christ, when we get that relationship. We want to tell other people what happened to us. Look at verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who'd made him well. You don't have to go into the temple. He knew who Jesus was. He got the information that he needed on who had healed him. And when we come to Christ, we ought to come to church so that we can learn, so that we can grow, so that we can learn more about Jesus. But there's a couple things in this story that I want us to look at real quick tonight as we finish up. John's going to put them on the screen for us. And we'll move through them pretty quick. First thing I want you to see is this. There are hurting people all around us just looking for help. The first four verses, says, and we've read them, but I'm going to read them again for you. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now it's in the Jerusalem by the sheep gate, the pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for a moving of the water. They're hurting people. They were waiting for something to happen. They were waiting for a miracle. They were waiting for just some chance that they could be healed. And guess what? There's people like that all over today who are just looking for something. You see them everywhere. You may see them at your job. You may see them at the market. You may see them in your neighborhood. But everywhere we go, there are people who are hurting. Before you came to Christ... If you were an adult or older, do you remember what it felt like? Do you remember the searching that was going on inside of you? The hole that just felt like it was there that couldn't be filled? There's people like that everywhere looking for somebody to help him. They look for peace everywhere they can. They look for it in money, trying to earn as much as they can and their accomplishments, trying to climb the corporate ladder or, or get ahead any way that they can so that they can try to get that fulfillment because something's just missing. They try it in their job. They try it in relationships. That's why there's so many who are addicted to alcohol and drugs trying to fill that void. Something's just missing in my life. They look in sex and they look in power and they try to find that thing that's missing. And they're never able to do it until they come to Jesus. And they're all around us. Do you see them? Are you looking? Or have you just become immune to it? And we go through our day without thinking the first thing about the person who sits next to us at work or the person in front of us at the line in the store. Do we really see them? Or do we put our little blinders on and just get through my day because I have important things to do and I need to do this and I need to do that? Or are we looking for those appointments that God has set up for us? There's a couple that comes to church every Sunday and sits right over in the back row. Last name, I won't tell you who they are just in case you meet them or you get to. Great couple. Awesome couple. I met them in Chipotle when we first moved up here. I like Chipotle. I know that probably surprises some of you that I like to eat. But if you look at me, it won't take you long to figure that out. My son and I, Gabe, we walk into Chipotle and we sit down and we get a burrito and we're sitting there eating. And I look over and this lady has a uh, Clemson Tiger sweatshirt on. And I had just moved up here from South Carolina. So I walked over and said, hey, you guys uh, from South Carolina or are you just like Clemson? Oh, they told us about how they had moved up here not long ago. I think 
he was from up here and she was from down there, kind of backwards from me and my wife. My wife's from up here and I'm from the south. So they had just moved up here not long ago and they only live a couple miles from the church and talked to them for a few minutes, invited them to church and they came. And that was the week before Easter. Easter Sunday, they had four guests with them and they've been here almost every Sunday. There are people looking everywhere. People, who, and you know what's funny, what they said is, we didn't know a church like this existed up here. How sad is that? We ought to be sharing our faith, and people ought to know about our church. They ought to know that there's people here who care about them, a place that can make a difference in their life. Second thing is this in our story. Jesus saw his need and stepped in to help. Seeing the need is not just enough. Seeing the people is not just enough. It's not enough for us to just see that there are hurting people. We've got to step in and we've got to do something. Verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him lying there. When's the last time you reached out to somebody in need? Where I grew up in Kentucky, I was up in the northern tip of Kentucky, inside the loop of Cincinnati. So it was pretty much Ohio. We told everybody Cincinnati because nobody knows where Lakeside Park, Kentucky is. Anybody ever heard of Lakeside Park, Kentucky? Okay, you heard of Cincinnati? Okay, see, that's why I say I'm from Cincinnati, so everybody knows where that is. There was a guy who would always sit up at the end of the exit ramp. Our, our, where we lived was right off the exit, and he would beg. He's a homeless guy. And he'd show up once every few months or so, and at first I never really thought about it. I was getting off the exit one day, and he was standing there, and it just hit me. I wonder if that guy knows Christ. I said, okay, I'll get up there and... He was talking to somebody else, and the light turned green. And if you don't go, you know what happens when, to the people behind you? They tell you, you're number one, you're going to heaven, and they honk the horn. And um, so I had to go quickly, and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run down to McDonald's, which was right around down this next street. I thought, I'm going to get him some lunch. I'm going to walk over there, and I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to talk to him for a few minutes. I said, Lord, if you want me to talk to this guy, let him still be there. Get off, run down to McDonald's, come back up. He's still there. Okay, Lord. Parked the car, run out to the corner, give him a sandwich, talked to him, said he had been to church, said he was a Christian, gave him a meal, he thanked me, never saw the guy again. Last time I saw him. Next week I'm in Florence, Kentucky, about five minutes from uh, where I, our church was. Anybody ever heard of Florence? Any everybody ever seen, there's a water tower that says Florence Y'all, Y-A-L-L -L on it, and that's what Florence is known for, a water tower. Got a lot going on there. I'm at a Chick-fil-A, Christian chicken, good stuff. Every Christian should eat Chick-fil-A. So go through the drive-thru. I see that hand. That's a good witness there. Um, guy sitting over there, my son's with me. And Gabe says, hey, Dad, that guy, I wonder if he's got anything to eat. So Gabe woke me up. We go through and get an extra sandwich, go over and give the guy a sandwich and, and begin to talk to him. Turned out he was a Christian. He's just passing through and hadn't eaten in two days. You know, there's people that are hurting and, and have needs. Not all of them are going to come to Christ, but what's the harm in us providing a meal for somebody who needs it? Or reaching out with a helping hand to someone who needs a hand, needs a little bit of help. Jesus saw the need and he stepped in and he did something about it. Third thing I want us to see in our story is this. No one else cared enough to help the guy. Nobody else cared. Verse 7 says, when Jesus asked, the sick man answered him, talking to Jesus, and said, Sir, I have no man to help me into the pool. Nobody else wanted to be inconvenienced or to step in and help. Because helping others is an inconvenience, isn't it? Doing something for someone else is an inconvenience. And it may cost you. It might cost you a little bit of money. It might cost you a little bit of your time. It might cost you your energy. It may cost you a little bit of something to help somebody else. But if we'll just get our eyes off ourselves we'll see a world that is full of needs and people who are hurting and have needs that we as Christians, supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. When's the last time you used your hands or your feet like Jesus would have? That's what we're supposed to do as Christians. But we got to get our eyes off ourselves. So who is in your path every day that needs help? Who's in the path that you go every day that needs Jesus? As we go on in our story, the next thing I want us to see, and we're almost finished, is this. Jesus cared more about helping hurting people than offending the religious people. Ouch. You see, we live our life for people that are around us in church, don't we? We've got to wear the right clothes. Got to have, if you have hair, it's got to be nice. 
We got to act a certain way, talk a certain way. And when we walk in those doors, all our troubles disappear. How you doing? I'm doing great, brother. How's things? Oh, man, if I was any better, I'd be twins or triplets. That's a southern saying, too. You probably don't know that one. We put on this good show and we pretend like we've got it all together. Just had a fight with my wife in the car on the way to church. Not me, because I figured out how to not fight with your wife on the way to church. We just don't ride together. We take two cars. We've never fought on the way to church, ever. <laughs> Fixed it. But people will have arguments in the car, and as soon as they get out and start to walk in church, pretend like they got it all together. Everything's good. We're looking good. And we live our life for other people. Got to have this car because that person has it. Got to have, oh, man, my... My ceilings are only nine foot, and their ceilings are ten foot. We've got to remodel the house. They have a nicer yard than me. They have this. They have that. I've got to have this. They got to have, we got to one-up with everybody and try to have what everybody else has. And we live our life for other people who are Christians. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't care so much. Verse 9 says, and that was the Sabbath day that he healed him. Verse 12 says, that when they saw him, it says, Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? See, Jesus didn't come to get a following of religious people. There was plenty of those. According to Luke 19.10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And his purpose should be our purpose. We should be caring about hurting people and, and sharing the gospel with them. Last thing is this. After he met Jesus, the next place we find him is in the temple. <laughs> Verse 14, afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple. Like I said, I don't know for sure why he's there, but I guess he was worshiping God and praising God and probably jumping up and down and running. You know, it probably looked a little Pentecostal running around through there because he hadn't been able to walk in 38 years. If I hadn't been able to walk in 38 years, guess what I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be running. I'm gonna be, and I'm not a runner. You can look at me and tell that, but I'd be running. But that's what I, we don't know what he was doing. But he was in the temple and Jesus finds him there. And, and, and when Jesus changes our life, we ought to be worshiping and praising him for all that he's done for us. So as we go fishing this week, as we're out in our daily life, look for people who are hurting. Guess what? You're not going to have to look hard because they're everywhere. Look for people who are all around you who are hurting. They may be in the cubicle next to you at work. Maybe in front of you, a line at Target or whatever store you're at. They may live next door to you. I had a preacher friend who would always finish to his services by saying this. Be kind to somebody because everybody's having a hard time. And we as Christians, that ought to be a mark of us. Being kind. Showing the love of Jesus Christ to the world that we're in. Because there's hurting people all around us. And we have the only cure for the pain that they're suffering from. So let's step in and let's make a difference in their life. And let's do it today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we love you so much. Thank you for caring about us. Thank you for stepping into my life and making a difference. And changing everything. Thank you for caring. And now, Lord, help me. Help me to care about others the way you did. Help me to show love to others the way you did. Those that are hurting, those that are going through a tough time, those that are in pain, those that have physical problems, Lord, those are the people you came to save. You came to save all of us that were lost. So help me to have a heart like you. And help each of us as we go our way tonight to look for people who are hurting and to not just see them, but to step in and make a difference. We love you, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.